by police from four detachments in a riot squad with steel helmets, gas masks, and clubs. The picket line holds. Warner Brothers, as predicted, is shut down. But something that might seem almost inconceivable in the early 21st century is about to break out. Class war in the San Fernando Valley. Now that beginning of my book sort of sets the tone for the book and, and kind of reflects the tone of, uh, of the politics of film these days and uh, the storyline that unfolds in the book. And it all, I, I started this book, which is it's a critique of the, of the uh, studio system and a celebration of the worldwide independent movement as kind of a resistance movement to the studio system. I started this, I was writing f uh, film reviews uh, a few years ago and seeing one bad film after another. And as a kid who grew up loving old Hollywood movies, you couldn't help but ask yourself, you know, what's, why are the movies so bad these days? And so that was kind of the genesis of this book. And it's one of those questions, like a lot of questions in the society, that when you ask yourself that, before you know it, sooner or later, you find yourself face to face with corporate power and looking at how that affects things. And, and what I learned through the research is the more corporate the studios have become, their wor the worse their movies have become. And here's a, another section from the book that, re that deals with that. Well, English is the studio's language of choice. No language at all is even better when you have a global target audience. So the studios have invented a new kind of silent picture computerized effects, car crashes, and other action in place of dialogue aimed at youthful male moviegoers everywhere. It's no longer unusual for a studio movie to premiere overseas and draw most of its revenues outside North America. Local culture falls prey to the globalization of culture uh, because to survive, read, expand, and dominate, corporate film, television, music, and publishing require a worldwide audience. While culture corporations like to speak of the free flow of information, in their reality, that means freedom for their products to reach a global audience without such nagging impediments as local cultures. So its noise drowns out local artists while its film industry benefits from local grants, tax breaks, anti-union legislation, and public financing of new roads and other infrastructure. It's a socialization of corporate costs alongside the privatization of cultural profits. The benefactors of this public largesse pull up stakes whenever not properly pampered. Besides running roughshod over other countries' filmmakers and cinemas, studio globalization means outsourcing Hollywood to the lowest bidder. Along with dictating which movies are seen, it determines where movies are made. Subsidizing corporate billionaires has become a way of life in today's film world. So what you have is you have a situation where uh, all sorts of U.S. states, all sorts of uh, countries all over the world, Eastern Europe, everywhere, are, are competing with each other for to offer the largest tax concessions to studios to make their movies there. Uh, basically, these are billionaires giving all sorts of tax breaks. And in a way, it, it's not that different from what the Republicans are pro proposing during this uh, election in terms of uh, you know, reducing taxes for billionaires. And, and, and that's essentially how the, how the uh, film industry works. And, and that's not the only connection between film and politics. And one of the things I try to do with the book is show how you know, the roots of today's ideology, even even talking, it's kind of timely because we're talking about this now during a, during a US election, and the roots of today's politics are intricately tied to the history of Hollywood and, and filmmaking. And that happens in every country, but it's particularly unique in the US. And a, a couple of points I'll make on that specifically is that um, the blacklist in Hollywood of the late 1940s and 50s up until that point, the U.S. had a left, just like Western Europe or Canada. There was a socialist movement in the United States. And I, the purpose of the Cold War, to, from the, w the way I see it anyway, the purpose of the Cold War, uh, it, was, it was presented as a war against the Soviet bloc, but it was really a war to demonize the domestic left. And they won that war. By the end of the 1950s, most people in America sort of looked at the word socialism as some kind of equivalency of, of criminal behavior. And I think, uh, whereas that didn't happen in the rest of the Western world. And that was the intention of the blacklist which, and the witch hunts, which were most famously done in Hollywood. So that's intricately tied to Hollywood. And once the right had done in the word socialism, they turned on the word liberalism. And then Ronald Reagan, who of course came out of Hollywood, 
uh, took it a step further beyond just demonizing socialism and liberalism. He demonized the very idea of government itself doing anything. And, and it's interesting if you look at Reagan in terms of his connection to Hollywood and, and uh, current ideology, is that Reagan wrote to the presidency basically through a backroom deal with the, he was the president of the Screen Actors Guild, which had this backroom deal with the MCA agency to make him, to represent him and also hire him as the um, host of Death Valley Day, Days, which led to him becoming the governor of California, which led to him becoming the United States, which led to this anti-government ideology, which is typified right now in, in the Republican campaign. I mean, basically, from what I can tell, what they're saying, it's not that different from how the film industry works, is that, um, you know, uh, rich people should pay less taxes, and it'll be good for everybody, we'll all have more jobs. So, I mean, the logical conclusion of that is that they should pay no taxes at all. I mean, if less taxes mean it's better for us, then probably they should pay none, and then it, it would be, you know, everything would be great. I mean, you don't need schools, you don't need teachers, you don't need firefighters, you don't need highways. All you really need is uh, rich people, and everything will be fine. So, I mean, we should probably pay them to be rich, and then just think of all the jobs they would create. And anyway, now the, the point I'm making is how this ties in with film is that it's the same ideology of film all over the world right now. That the reason Hollywood is declining its production, one of the major reasons is that the people are outsourcing it, the studios and the networks are outsourcing the work all over the world to the lowest bidders and the places where they pay the, the least tax. Um, the, the other thing that emerged with Hollywood um, in terms of the quality of their films was the emergence of the 1970s of their blockbuster strategy. And, and so what you have, you know, uh, it used to be at one point that the Hollywoods were, the studios were run by moguls, and as screwed up as they were, they at least loved movies. But now what's happened is you've got kind of, they're part of some giant conglomerate, and they hire some business grad who doesn't really care anything about film to run the, the film arm of, of the conglomerate, and their only concern is keeping their jobs. So if Spider-Man 2 makes money, they're going to greenlight Spider-Man 7 and grab Spider-Man 12 and Spider-Man 24, and it, it just, that's how the studios work, and that's why the movies are so bad. I mean, one of the, the best examples is of Star Wars. It was so convoluted, that series, that uh, episode six came out something like eight years before episode two. And, you know, or, or, and it works similarly to some extent in some of the studio indie world as well. Like Kill Bill, uh, for example, I mean, was a four-hour movie, which in the old days, you get a four-hour movie, you, you know, what do you do? Uh, maybe hire an editor? But what they did is they just cut it in two and, and sold it twice and called it two movies. And although, I mean, that's Tarantino, I, I do have a soft spot for him in some ways. I mean, his last film, Inglorious Bastards, for example, I must say that uh, I, I, I did find it kind of cathartic on some levels, that movie. I mean, the only thing that might have made it a little bit better is if they had, uh, you know, maybe cast Mel Gibson as, as the uh, Nazi who took the baseball bat in the face. Um, I mean, he's looking for work these days. He probably would have would have done that. Um, but anyway, um, the so so that's sort of the state of film right now. But the book that I've written is not a negative book. I mean, that, that it talks about the decline of studio film, but there's a whole positive side to all of this as well. And what that is is that the studios are in decline. That's actually a positive thing. Just like their brethren, the music. Uh, labels, but not it's not making quite the same free fall as the music labels, but they're still in decline. Their their revenues declining every year. They're making fewer movies, um, and, and and what's happened is as an alternative, there's been a huge rise of film outside the system. Um, there is, for example, John Sayles, who I interviewed, the book, told me when he was first started making movies in the 80s, there were 30 independent films made a year in the U.S. Last year, there was 12,000 submissions to Sundance. So digital has caused an explosion outside the system. Digital filmmaking, digital theaters, digital online. Uh, there's also movements around the world fighting for quota systems in which they demand a certain percentage of, of screen time in their countries are dedicated to their country's films. There's also, uh, Ken Loach suggested to me the idea of nationalizing theaters, which might sound kind of far-fetched, but that actually exists in Norway where there's community control of film. And so basically we're going through a massive change right now in uh, the politics of film and film. And I just want to read a quote here from Mike Lee, 
uh, the British filmmaker talking about this, that tectonic plates are shifting at a deeper level because there is no question that in the future people are going to make films and show films and see films in different ways. I like to think, as much as I love big screens and celluloid and all the rest of it, that the Hollywood dinosaur will actually become extinct. Now, which brings us to the movie we're going to watch tonight. John Cassavetes knew the Hollywood dinosaur was extinct even back in the 1950s. He knew this ahead of everybody else. And the movie we're going to see shadows is like a template. It was a template that was created for the independent film movement that's emerged in the last 50 years. It was one of the first independent films. It was shot in New York City. And it, it's an important film on many levels. For one thing, the actual shooting of it was a, a completely innovative and radical at the time. Uh, first of all, the, the actual process of making the film was this really unique improv style that he did with the actors. Secondly, um, the, the shooting was just completely pirate outlaw filmmaking, you know, guerrilla filmmaking, shooting all over the streets of New York, no permits, uh, and just going for it. Now, originally, the way this film came together, Cassavetes was, uh, was, had an acting school in New York, and he approached students one day and said, could you show up this weekend, I'm going to do a workshop. People thought it was just some kind of workshop, they, they didn't know what was going on with it. Turned out, he decided he was going to make a movie out of this story idea that he was workshopping. And at the same time, they still thought it was going to amount to anything. It was just like these, you know, it was going to be some student workshop film that no one would ever see. So that's what's so startling is that 50 years later, 50 plus years later, people are still watching this film. It's become a classic independent film. And the style of making the film became the template for independent filmmakers all over the world. And I just want to read a, a couple of quotes and we'll wrap it up and show the film. Um, but this is just uh, from, from Cassavetes himself. And it gives a sense of the spirit of the guy. This is him. There was a filmmaker named Jack Garfine who made movies, uh, a couple of great movies in, in uh, Hollywood in the late 50s before he was blackballed by the studio system. And, and Garfine, uh, this is just a, a quote from him. I was walking down Wilshire Boulevard and there was Cassavetes. He said, Jack, why the hell are you making movies? What's the matter with you? I'm telling you, no one's got the performance out of Gazzara you got. I said, listen, I admire you because you get 100,000 or 150,000 for acting in a film and you can put it into something if you, that you, you want to make it. That's because uh, Cassavetes is also an actor who finances his own films. It's absolutely great, but I can't get any money. No one will give me the money to do it. Next day my phone rings and it's John. He said, Jack, I've got all the cameras for you. I've got all the editing equipment. You've got it all. You don't pay for anything. Make a movie. And this was a spirit when nobody was doing independent stuff. This was the spirit that Cassavetes had. And the last quote I'm going to have from, uh, regarding Cassavetes before we, we move on is this was, I, I attended this uh, screening of Woman Under the Influence at UCLA a couple of years ago. And there was a bunch of cast and crew of, of his, that movie there. And they were talking about working with Cassavetes. And, the, and this one cameraman, named Mike Ferris was going on about uh, how Cassavetes was a visionary, and, and others were there, like Seymour Cassell, who was very close to him and party, used to party constantly with Cassavetes all night long. He was there as well. And so Ferris was going on how visionary Cassavetes was, and he said, John saw the dawn before anyone else. And Cassell said, that's because he was up all night. <laughs> anyway, I'll wrap it up at that, and we'll show the film. And here's the, uh, what's going to happen after the film. Lalia Galdoni, who's the star of the film, is going to be here with me, and we'll do a Q&A, talk about the making of the movie. And after that, I'll be signing some of the books, the books shoot it there, uh, you know, if anyone is interested in purchasing it and signing it. Anyway, thanks very much. because it is still being looked at and seen and valued, uh, then that gesture, that lunatic gesture of Cassavetes, uh, really made a profound difference in terms of how one conceives of filmmaking and acting in films, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, some of it is really brilliant acting, and some of it's not. But we all got away with what wasn't. He didn't wait. Indeed. Anyway, are there any questions here at all uh, about Lalia or myself or anyone? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, 
Nothing? There's oh, one back here. Were you involved with in the data that was saying that uh, these were acting students of John's? Oh, we were all acting students. Uh, you know, the, the interesting, well, uh, yes, we went, all went to his class. I went and saw the class one day and he said, was I interested in coming? I said, yes. He said, well, come. I said, I don't have any money. And he said, well, what can you do? And I said, I can teach dance. And everybody who's in the film, not the girls, only the guys, uh, Hugh Hurd was in it, uh, uh, Rupert Cross, Ben Carruthers, Tony Ray, the, the, the guy who plays the other singer, uh, they all came to the class. Uh, and uh, that's, I don't know how, whether that was the thing that stimulated all of this for John, but we all got to be chums. And um, that's how I got involved. I was doing scenes and amazing, amazing. I did a, a monologue from, Orsa, uh, from Oscar, well, no, God. Who wrote Salome? Oscar Wilde. That's the one, Oscar Wilde. From Oscar Wilde's Salome, I did the, the big monologue. And he, he started talking to me about, well, what do you, blah, 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 blah. Before you knew it, the son of a bitch, excuse me, Casvetis was on the, on the stage with me. And we were having a physical fight. My pulling his hair down, you know, and rolling. I mean, it was like a ballet. And it was, I mean, for everybody watching that, uh, one suddenly lost any kind of sensation that you mustn't. That's not appropriate. Because all of a sudden, everything was on the, on the table in a funny kind of way. And, and um, I think that was probably one of the reasons why uh, I, I'm in the movie. Anyway, that's it. Other questions? Um, yeah, uh, I was just wondering how long it took from like the workshop to it becoming like a feature film, and just like uh, the follow-up question would be like, how did Cassavetti like keep you guys committed for that long? Like, you need a microphone. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, the, the first question is just um, yeah, how long did it take from the workshop, like the it's not very long, okay, mm -hmm. not very long. Uh, I mean, we started doing, you know, scenes in the class that had nothing to do with this. And one day, John comes up to me in one of the classes, one of the sessions, and said, well, uh, what are you doing Sunday at 1 o'clock? What? He said, could you be here at 1 o'clock? I said, oh, okay. And then I'm watching him, and he goes to Hugh Hurd and, and whispers to him. So all of the people, the guys that I knew from my class, we all checked out what was going on, and he, they said, oh, we're all, he invited us to come on Sunday at 1 o'clock. For what? We had no idea. Absolutely no idea. We showed up. And then he started making up this garbage. I mean, okay, you, he's going to come in and do it. And it was, I mean, when I say garbage, it had made no sense at all. Uh, it, not just in my memory, but it did not make any sense. The next thing we know is that he's on the uh, Gene Shepherd show saying he's got this class and he wants to make a movie. And he's going to make a movie with this class if you send money in. Okay? And the minute they got a dollar, that was the end of it. There was no way we couldn't do it. So before you knew it, we had you know, money coming in, a dollar, 50 cents, this kind of thing. All of those things were coming in, and we had to do this movie. And before you knew it, so-and-so was going to be the sound guy, and so-and-so was going to be something else. It was a, an amazing adventure. That's all I can say. And I look at it, and I think it still is an amazing adventure, because I can't get away from that first can you be here on Sunday at, at 1 o'clock? Uh, you know, this mysterious notion. Anyway, is that satisfying? Uh, yeah, and just a follow-up question. Oh. Just, um, how, how was he able to like keep you guys committed through the entire process? How could he make us? Uh, I think I'm going deaf. I'm getting old. How was he able to like keep you guys committed through the entire process? Like, from Oh, there was, once we got started, we would never walk out of the, the process because we were all very familial, both from class 
et cetera, et cetera. I, I've always had a very strange feeling that he came up with this idea because of Hugh Hurd. Uh, Hugh Hurd was always asking me if I'd had food. Did I? Did you eat tonight? Oh, come on, I'll take you out for a hot hamburger. But it was very familial. He was always treating me as though he was my brother. And I think that I think the film came out of that observation on his part. I say that in complete ignorance, but it makes perfect sense to me anyway. Um, so I know most of it was improvised. Mm -hmm. How much of a structure of plot, storyline, whatever, did Cassavetes have? Do you maybe not even know, but the general sense going into the plot? Well, I think that. Hello. Are you there? <laughs> Um, okay. Um, well, the the thing the thing about it was that he had an idea. That he had four or five specific ideas. One was to tell you the God honest truth. It, the 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 first version of the film was primarily about Ben, and then they added several scenes of, of me, which changed the whole balance of, of the film, and and so. It was about Ben struggling with his racial identity because he had two white friends. He was always hanging out with white women. Uh, and so there's a big party at the house, the big party, where everybody there is, you know, multicolored, so to speak. And he freaks out and gets thrown out of the house and so on and so on and so forth. That w it was really about the dynamic of this family life that had to deal with each of the children's growing up, including their own. And that was very specific. I mean, that, that point of identity was very specific, uh, partly because we all knew each other so well, but also because of the, the way the scenes were set up. Uh, and so, you know, the fight with uh, Jackie uh, at the party and, the, uh, you, know, throwing, you know, pushing her around, was uh, improvised. It came out of what was what was go generated by their uh, conversations. So it was f pretty specific, you know, in terms of who does what, where, what, but not in terms of how you did it. Well, so one of sorry. In that so in that party scene, then uh, did they shoot the party scene and the scene with you on the couch? Was that shot at the same time? Was that shot after? Uh, no, I was there on the. You, where, where I'm getting, the, where I'm couch. talking to my girlfriend. Right. And yeah, that was that was being shot at the same time. Not not with two cameras. It was like, okay, it was different, but it was the same time. You, you know, one of the things I think is interesting about the improvisational aspect of it is that, as far as I know, this is the first film that did that. I mean, it's become a form that a lot of independent filmmakers use, like especially Mike Lee's probably the most famous, the British filmmaker who all of his films, he, he'll actually spend six months working on characters with his actors and then, you know, they know where they're going with the story, but basically it's the actors who, who deliver the lines. And, and there's other directors that do that too, but as far as I know, this I mean, it's completely new at this point. I mean, it was really yeah. groundbreaking in that yeah. way that it was an, an improvisational film. Yeah. And anyway, other questions? How long had you been in class when the project started? Um, well, probably a couple of months, not really very long. I mean, I had, I was a performer, I was with the Lesser Horton dancers, and danced with Alvin Ailey and Carmen de Lavala and a lot of other, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, um, as a matter of fact, I lived with Alvin in order to make this movie, because I was staying with my uncle out in Flushing, <clears throat> and there was no way I was going to be able to do travel back and forth and, you know, work that hard. So Alvin gave me a, a bed, a New York bed. Anyway, uh, so, uh, but, so I had been a performer and I'd studied with a guy called Jeff Corey in California, uh, <clears throat> who was a blacklisted actor. Anyway, that was, that was how it was. But it, he just got so crazy, I mean, uh, obsessed with this whole, process and I mean John that there was no way it wasn't going to happen no way I mean we they showed it a couple of times and I went back to California 
Um, I married Ben for a brief time, Carruthers, and um, then uh, they had a screening here in New York, and then the next thing I know is there's a, a phone call, we're gonna add some scenes. And all the scenes that were added were the Tony scene, um, the um, dance sequence with, uh, uh, with, I can't remember his name, a Broadway a singer, actor, guy, <clears throat> anyway, so all of that stuff was, you know, was added. The coffee shop with David and uh, the three, three guys, was all that, that was new, added uh, material, ideas. So that, that's how it, you know, it happened. It just got bigger or something, longer. Now one of the interesting bits of casting in this is Tony uh, is Anthony Ray, Tony Ray, was Nicholas Ray's. So Nicholas Ray, the, the director of Rebel Without a Cause and In a Lonely Place and some other great films, uh, that was his son, as far as I know, the only performance, on-screen performance he ever did as, as the white boyfriend. Um, no, he actually did some television stuff yes, after that. But no features. As oh, no, not, not to my but, knowledge. Um, anyway, other questions? What, what did you do after this? Are you out of your mind? You don't, exactly, you don't know exactly the before Johnny Staccato, or was there Oh no, jo uh, no Johnny Staccato came after after this uh, right. because he got Johnny Staccato. And the only time I ever worked with John again was when he was directing television. I did two Johnny Staccatos, and I direct. He did another thing. I direct did that, and it was it got to the point where it was very clear I wasn't going to work in this town, in L.A. So I went to England, and I found out years later that I was absolutely right. Everybody was afraid that I was actually black, okay? Um, and uh, they said if anybody found out, they would lose their jobs, okay? In England, they thought it was actually kind of kinky. So uh, I worked a lot in England. But the films that I did, I did a couple of television shows in England that were you know, people really raved about, were nominated for awards and stuff, and um, did a lot of junk too. Uh, but I did a movie like uh, um, Day of the Locust, mm -hmm. uh, and I did a film called uh, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. It was nominated for the British Academy Award for that. Did you like doing television or the films? What did you like? I prefer to films. I mean, in England it's different uh, because you do. There, we did. I did a lot of movies at the week, which are almost like shooting a film. I, I did um, a thing called uh, I can't remember the name of it. I'm so old. I'm 20 days away from being 76, so I, I have the right to forget names. That's that's my excuse. Uh, but I did a show with Edward Woodward. Where he played um, he played uh, uh, Scott Fitzgerald, and I played Zelda. That was like shooting a movie. Uh, then a few, a few of the other movies of the week were like shooting a movie. Uh, but the series, you know, I mean, I'm happy to do them, you know. But I did a lot of, and then I did a movie called Blood Brothers uh, with Richard Gere and was also nominated. No, I know, that was the Oxford Film Festival. I won that for Best Supporting Actress. So that's it. Anything else? Yeah? Was this the co-director Edward D. Wood Jr.? Say that again, sweetheart? Edward D. Wood. Was this Edward D. Wood Jr. who did Plan 9 from Outer Space? No. No, no. Uh-uh. No, I never, no, I never heard that name, honey. <laughs> okay. okay. Other questions? And my son's not here. was the shoot? And, and there was, I, there were two different versions or the second? Just the, uh, yeah, there were two different versions, yes. Yes. Didn't it actually go on about two years altogether? Did they include no. both versions? No, no, no. Uh, what happened was that they, what, what they did in terms of cutting it, I have no idea because I wasn't around, but we probably shot the first version Probably, uh, we started shooting it like I think around October and finished it around January-ish, February, around there. And then they cut it and had a screening uh, in June or something like that. And then they took it off the market, whatever. And then we, uh, 
I, we came back and, and they called me up and said, would I come back and shoot? And so then there was another, that was done pretty quickly. The, the, that shoot was probably about a month tops. And then they took it to England. So that was just added scenes. Yeah, it wasn't yeah, yeah. a whole other version. Oh, no, yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, one thing I'm interested in, in terms of feedback from the audience is there, are there people here who have not seen this before? And I'm just wondering if maybe you could say what your reaction is to it. I mean, what do you think of it as a film, watching it uh, all these years later? Hey, okay. Yeah, sorry, this is the first time I've seen it. I'm to see it. Um, my very first thought a few minutes in was how much Scorsese owes Casabetti's. Just New York filmmaking. And I had made that connection until I saw this. Was there anything specifically that sure. added to this conversation? It was that, that same sense New York, your life, the improvisational aspect of it, the camera work, the relationships. Well, you know, one of the things, too, is that how significant the film is. Like a lot of people, I mean, this is like, you know, although it was done on no budget, it was not, I mean, this movie, like, I would say in the 1970s, what happened was there was kind of two routes for independent filmmakers, or maverick filmmakers. One was there was a, a movement called the New Hollywood, which was probably the last good period of studio filmmaking. It was in the early 1970s. And because Easy Rider had been so successful, the studios who at the time didn't know what they were doing figured, well, there's all these countercultural filmmakers in LA that we're gonna throw money at, and they're gonna have more successes like Easy Rider. And so for about five years, there were all these really interesting films that were made in LA. It's good. The movement called the New Hollywood includes movies like The Last Picture Show, Five Easy Pieces, The Godfather. Um, and then what happened was the blockbuster movement, you know, with Jaws and Superman and Star Wars came in and they got rid of those Mavericks. But the thing that's interesting about it in terms of, of uh, Shadows is that at that point, the kind of debate was, should independent filmmakers try to work within the system like the new Hollywood's doing, or should they go outside of it like Shadows? And so Shadows was like a huge template for you know, the future of independent filmmaking. And ultimately, if you look at it historically, probably the correct route would have been to have gone Shadows. And that's what people do now. They work outside the system. They can't work in the studios anymore. So what he did, and, and what Lelia did and the cast did, is amazingly groundbreaking. I mean, you look at it now, it's this little film that was made for nothing, and, and if you don't know the context of it, sometimes you don't realize how significant this movie is. But it's, you know, a hugely important movie in the history of film. There was, a, during the 70s, uh, one of the things I remember was that they, they had, which kind of spurred some independent filmmaking, and I don't know if you covered it in the book, was that, uh, they created a tax shelter for uh, people who could invest in films. And in, in a funny way, a lot of, uh, I remember a couple of people where they would get you know, groups of uh, people that they knew to invest in a film with this encouragement that they could keep writing off this tax shelter over the years. So whether the movie succeeded or it didn't, the person had an advantage to it. And then that was killed during the Carter years. So. I was wondering if that uh, played into any of the films that, that you were studying when you were uh, developing films in the 70s. That, that oh, well, you know, the, to be honest, I mean, the major films of the period that were kind of the real, looked at as the rebel maverick films, were actually done within the studio system then. I mean, there was a, a brief window then. I mean, it's interesting if you look at the history of, of you know, Hollywood. There's been certain moments where commercial films have been good, really good, um, for different reasons. And I mean, you know, Casablanca and, and Citizen Kane and, and Wizard of Oz, all those movies were commercial films, if you think about it. At one point, the studios actually made movies like that. Um, and I think what happened was, and that sort of goes back to that quote I read from the book at the beginning of that, that riot in Hollywood, that was a major, major thing in the history of Hollywood. That riot was part of a, a, a shutdown strike in Hollywood in 1945-46 that virtually shut down the, the, the town. And at, at that point, the studios signed on to the blacklist. And I think if you look at the pre-blacklist period, the movies I just mentioned, for example, 
all there were major roles played by people who later were blacklisted. And I think what happened was is when talking pictures were invented in 27, there were no weekend screenwriting symposiums. I mean, there were no film studies programs. And so the studios figured this is where the money is, but we don't know how to make these movies. Where are we going to get the writers and the directors? So they came to New York, and they found people here, and they took them out to Hollywood. And for the next 15 years, they did great movies like that. And then after that strike, though, the studios decided, you know, we didn't really give a shit about their politics before, but now they're, it's this getting serious. It's starting to cause problems for us, these people we brought out here. And so that's how, that was the root of the blacklist, right? And I don't think Hollywood ever, I, I mean, Hollywood has ever completely recovered from that in terms of being as overtly progressive the films or as being as good qualitatively. And so, I mean, there's other things besides the blacklist why the studios have, have, have reached the nadir that they're at now. But I'm just saying that was a major point. And so that pre-blacklist period, there was some wonderful, especially Warner Brothers did these great gangster pictures with Bogart and John Garfield and all those people. And so there were some wonderful films made during that period. And then later on, in the early 70s, was another great period. And so there's been certain moments for different reasons when really good commercial films have been made. And, and I think the last one was probably the early 70s, running roughly from The Graduate in 1967 to uh, Godfather II, basically. That was the last era. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I, in answer to your question, though, I think primarily that period was more driven by those stu studio movies. Anyway, other, other questions or comments yeah, about I this movie? I see, as you said, the connection to Scorsese and also to Breathless. Uh, to Godard. I mean, it, all that influence on the French was just incredible from this film. How long did you stay in England? I mean, I always wondered why your career after this didn't take off. You were so beautiful. You're so talented. I was so beautiful. And so and so talented. Talented. You said so talented. You know, and oh, wow. then, and so. She didn't hear the talented part. And she knows that she's so talented. I she's so talented. And, you know, and. Well, no, and, and so no, what you said about they thought you were black, and so yeah. you got it, it was a re it was really interesting because uh, I uh, John introduced me to his agent, which was GAC. Some of you might know who they were, but that was like one of the top agencies in in uh, Los Angeles. And I got this a guy who was like a real hustler. Uh, I can't I, I can see his face, and his name will come up two hours from now. Um, and, and he had me out meeting all the top casting people in town. Now, all the top casting people in town, every studio had people that were looking for contract, people they could put under contract or people they could hire. And all of these people took hours of meetings. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, you're so wonderful. You're so great. Blah, 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 blah. And nothing, absolutely nothing happened. And finally, about four months later, when this was all going on, they actually, uh, the agency told me that they had heard that they were very concerned that I was black. And the word wasn't black in those days. It wasn't coffee colored either. But the, so the thing about it was, was that they, it became very clear that if, if that was the problem, there was nothing I could do to change their points of view because it, you know this is who I am, and um, so I decided I went to London and you know was there for the premiere of, of Shadows and everybody treated me you know with such incredible royalty and the next thing I know I'm working there. Now I met somebody and they said they thought I was black but they thought it was really kind of kinky. So I, you know, I did tons of movies of the week for the BBC and Granada and all kinds of places, and a lot of junk like, you know, uh, a Secret Agent Man, you know, that kind of. Thing. But I, I learned more, an awful lot about working in, in a commercial situation, you know, about the camera and things like that, which I never learned on Shadows. It doesn't mean that I pay attention to it. It just means I know where the camera is, which I didn't know before. Anyway. So that's why, that's what happened. And then when I came back, years later, I met these casting people and they said, you know, we thought you were black and we couldn't, we couldn't risk our career because suppose it came out that you were. And you know, there were lots of actors who played uh, Pinky for one thing, Gene, Gene Crane and, and 
you know, blog somebody else as well. But everybody knew their work because they had a career, and it, you know, they had there was knowledge behind who they were. There was no knowledge behind me at all, and I was with that strange company, you know, the only interracial dance company in the world, the Lester Orton Dancers. So, you know, what did that mean? You know? Anyway, that's well, you know, uh, that's an interesting point though, in another way too, because if you actually look at the time when this film came out, like in the late 1950s beyond, you know, the personal issues that, that Lelia had. And it was the beginning of the civil rights movement, really. And so this movie, in that sense, is very groundbreaking as well. I mean, having an interracial relationship in the late 1950s in a movie. And, um, you know, that, that whole stuff was just about to explode everywhere. Maybe one more short question. Anyone else has a final question? Well, final you know, question. they can ask short questions, but the fact is, is that I don't know how to answer short. <laughs> <laughs> well, so one more That's question, okay. and then if you have any other comments, you know, we talk to Lalia person, you know, whatever, or myself. And I and I, after after it wraps up, the last question, I was going to sign some books. If anyone wants anything signed, at the at the front there. And uh, any questions? Do you want to say anything? Anyone? Oh, there's one. Um, I mean, you talk about how groundbreaking it is now. How was the film received when it came out back then? Well, my understanding is, and Lalia probably knows more about this than I do, but my, my understanding was that it played New York, uh, and, and, and a lot of people here uh, the, you know, within the New York underground at the time were blown away by it. It went to Europe. It was very popular in England. It played you know, some other European cities and, and was received quite well. But in those days, you have to understand, or even now, there's no real access to screens if you're not a studio movie. So it was not widely distributed at all back there, but it was kind of an underground hit. You know, it was recognized as a hit. And it was popular enough that it got Cassavetes a studio deal as a director. And he went out to LA and directed a couple of studio movies, and he absolutely loathed the experience and, and said he would never do that again. And from the rest of his career, he ran, you know, they were all independent films. But the thing that's interesting in this film, you know, it, most, a lot of people anyway, I mean, it's all very subjective, but a lot of people consider this, along with Faces and Woman Under the Influence, to be Cassavetti's three great films. So although this movie was made for nothing, uh, well, I'll just say one funny little story about the movie in terms of the funding of it, is that after they did their workshop, and they didn't even, they thought it was just a main class workshop, uh, Castavetti's went on a popular radio show uh, that was in uh, New York at the time, the Gene Shepherd show, so some all night or midnight radio talk show. And he went on there, and he was there ostensibly to promote some movie that he was acting in at the time. He he was an actor as well at the time. But instead, he started started went off into this exercise they'd done in class, and he said he just said on the radio, and no one in the, in the class knew that this was happening or he was going to say this, that he was making a movie. And it's about this interracial relationship, and it's, well, it's going to be different than any other movie anyone's ever seen. And it's a completely different kind of idea. And that anyone, he has no money for it, and anyone out there who wants to contribute money should send money into the Gene Shepherd show for him. And uh, apparently within the next few days, and this was a fair amount of money back then, something like $2,000 came in, in $2 bill, $5, $1 bill, this kind of thing. And within, I, and that really sort of got it off the ground. Well, there's also something else I want to tell you. It played at one theater in London for 15 months. And that was the Oxford Street Theater. Anyway, um, I'm going to go sign the book. Okay. And you're gonna... I'm going to say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>